I'm Nathan Rutherford, and welcome to Myth Madness. Dionysus is commonly known as the Greek god of wine, making him a god that a whole lot of us can pray to. He's imagined as spending time in forest groves, drinking and partying with his worshippers, often human women and half-men, half-goat satyrs. Dionysus is fun, but maybe a little too fun, because you can't forget about the other, more complicated, and even darker side of Dionysus. He is also responsible for madness and frenzy. Dionysus was also incredibly important in the ancient Greek religion, and his cult was also very ancient, in one form or another going back to the heyday of Mycenaean Greece, and even, perhaps, Minoan Crete. The Greeks were very interested in the birth of Dionysus. They had a number of myths on the subject, and the different versions all appear to be very old. The first Homeric hymn, written sometime in the Archaic Age, even addresses this. It's actually all a bit meta. The hymn acknowledges different traditions for Dionysus' birth. It says, some say Dionysus was born on Icaros, and others say he was born by the Alpheos River, or in the city of Thebes. But, the hymn goes on to say, these stories are all lies. The truth is, Zeus gave birth to Dionysus in a remote place, far away from mortal humans, but especially in secret, away from his wife Hera. As summarized in Apollodorus's library, Zeus fell in love with Semele, a princess of the city of Thebes. Unlike a lot of Zeus's other relationships with mortals, this one seems to be more two-sided. Semele knew her lover was actually the king of the universe, and Zeus one day promised on the river Styx that he would give Semele anything she wanted. But unfortunately, his wife Hera was able to trick her. She convinced Semele to ask Zeus to appear in his true, divine form, just like how he appeared to Hera when he was with her. Since Zeus swore on the river Styx, he could not refuse the request, and arrived in Semele's room one night in his full splendor, with chariot and lightning and thunder. It was too much for Semele, a mere mortal. She either died of fright, or was burnt to death by the lightning and flames. Semele, though, at the time, was already pregnant with Zeus's child, and the king of the gods took the preterm baby from Semele's corpse, and stitched it into the flesh of his own thigh. For this reason, Dionysus is often called Dionysus Erephiota, Dionysus in Sown. Apollodorus's library was a late-period work of literature, but it is consistent with most of the earlier references to Dionysus in the Archaic and Classical period sources. The Homeric hymns call Dionysus in Sown too, and mention his parents being Zeus and Semele. The classical period playwright Euripides, though, does give a slightly different version. He doesn't tell the story of Semele being tricked and being burnt to a crisp when seeing Zeus's true form. Instead, Euripides says Semele arrogantly claimed to be married to Zeus, and was zapped by lightning for her hubris. Whichever way she dies, though, Dionysus was stitched into Zeus's thigh and was later born from his leg. After his birth, the Homeric hymn says that Zeus took the infant to be fostered by the nymphs of Mount Nysa. The nymphs raised him in secret in a sweet-smelling cave, and when he was older and wandered through the surrounding forests, they accompanied him and called them their leader. At some point in his youth, according to the poet Diodorus of Sicily, Dionysus discovered how to make wine from grapes, and he taught his followers how to cultivate grapes in the same way. Homer gives another story of Dionysus' youth on Mount Nysa. A king of Thrace, named Lycurgus, was a man who did not respect the gods. He and his soldiers once went into the forests of Mount Nysa and drove Dionysus and his followers out by force. They were forced to flee, and Dionysus dived into the ocean to escape and was rescued by Thetis. Thetis has popped up a few times in the myths so far. With Dionysus, she took the frightened god close and comforted him. Homer says that later, Lycurgus was made blind as punishment. He did not live long afterwards, since he was hated by all the immortals. But other versions sometimes give him a different fate. Apollodorus provides us with a grisly version. He says that Dionysus made Lycurgus go insane, and that in his madness, the arrogant king sawed off the arms and legs of his son, Dryas, thinking he was cutting a grapevine. 
The various sources also disagree on the timing of this myth. Homer's version, the one I just gave, said it happened when Dionysus was young and lived on Mount Nysa. But other sources say it happened when Dionysus was a grown adult and was traveling through the wild region of Thrace, north of Greece. By mentioning the revenge on Lycurgus during a time when Dionysus was traveling, these later sources are actually tying this myth into other myths about Dionysus traveling to different locations. A big part of the Dionysus myths was this traveling. A lot of the myths feature him traveling the world, and then returning to Greece. The version in Apollodorus' library says that Hera made Dionysus go insane himself, since he was one of Zeus's many illegitimate children and that afterwards he went to Egypt and the Middle East. There are various stories that give details on what he was doing around the world. A common reason is Dionysus goes from country to country and shares the art of winemaking with different people of the world. In Phrygia, it was said that Dionysus was taught religious rites and rituals by his grandmother, the Titan Rhea. In other stories, he is not just a teacher or student, but instead a conqueror. One large epic poem talks about his expedition fighting in India, and Diodorus of Sicily claimed Dionysus conquered the whole world. These myths on the details of Dionysus' travels are newer, being written in the Hellenistic period, around 320 BC and afterwards, when the Greeks were more familiar, due to the conquests of Alexander the Great, of what was happening in the world around them. In contrast, the earlier sources focus more on what Dionysus did when he and his followers returned to Greece. Probably the most famous is the myth telling how Dionysus came back to the city of Thebes. This story is fairly well known, because in 405 BC, the Athenian playwright Euripides wrote a play about it. The play is called Bacchae, and is one of the most well-known Greek tragedies, and is, according to some people, one of the best tragedies ever written. The play begins with Dionysus arriving in Thebes and vowing to set the city straight. The Thebans, under their king Pentheus, had offended Dionysus when they neglected his worship. Previously, Pentheus found out that women were sneaking out of the city to go into the mountains. Pentheus was especially disturbed to find out that these women go dancing and then participate in orgies and sneak into the beds of strange men. All of this was supposedly to honor a new deity called Dionysus, whoever he was. Pentheus doesn't know. The worshippers call themselves Bacchae. Pentheus goes looking for the women. When he finds them, he has his soldiers capture the women and imprison them. The ones he can't find, he orders hunted down. Dionysus in this play is a shapeshifter, and he first appears as a human priest, posing as the leader of the Dionysus worshippers. Pentheus describes this man as being from Lydia, a country in what is now Turkey, and having golden curly hair, and spending his time with young girls day and night. The disguised Dionysus is captured by Pentheus' men and brought to his palace for questioning. Dionysus tells Pentheus he was sent by the god Dionysus to bring his cult to the Greeks. He tells Pentheus that Dionysus is the son of Zeus and the Theban princess Semele, who Pentheus is related to. The disguised Dionysus tells Pentheus the rites of this new god are celebrated by all the barbarians who live outside Greece, and that the barbarians have become wise because of that. He tells Pentheus the rites are celebrated at night because darkness is important for creating awe among the worshippers. But Pentheus is not impressed. Pentheus orders him bound, thrown into darkness, and says that the women worshippers will be made slaves. Dionysus only laughs at Pentheus. He tells Pentheus that his god, he is of course speaking about himself, is waiting nearby, out of sight, and will free him whenever he wants. Sure enough, after some period of time, Dionysus creates a distraction. Pentheus's palace begins shaking, and a flame erupts over the tomb of Dionysus' mother Semele, thinking that the entire palace is about to burn down. Pentheus becomes scared, so he sends all his servants to gather vases and buckets of water and to work to put out the fire. In the middle of all that commotion, the chains fall off Dionysus, and he escapes from imprisonment. But the god is not done. He then creates a phantom to haunt the palace courtyard. Pentheus tries to stab it with a sword, but since it's only a ghost, he can't do anything about it. Then Dionysus caused the palace to fall down, and everything shattered to pieces. 
Surrounded by rubble, Pentheus survives, and soon a messenger is able to find him. The messenger tells him that he saw three groups of the female worshippers of Dionysus. Two groups of dancers were led by Odinoe and Eno, Pentheus's two aunts. The third group was led by Agave, Pentheus's mother. The messenger says that all the women were in a frenzy, and he watched them tear a cow to pieces, and only barely escaped the same fate himself. Pentheus plans to assemble a force of armed men to go and seize all these women. At this point, though, Dionysus, still disguised as a priest, shows himself again. He convinces Pentheus to not send armed men, and instead disguise himself as a woman worshipper and go spy on the women. Dionysus says that he will find them behaving modestly, but Pentheus expects them to be having orgies. He leaves the city with Dionysus and eventually finds the women in a little mountain valley. He can hear them singing, but not see them, so he points to a tall pine tree and says he wants to get a better look from there. And then, the disguised Dionysus does something which should have completely blown his cover. He reaches up to the top of the pine tree and pulls it down, so that the tree looks like a big arch, like something out of a Bugs Bunny cartoon. He sits Pentheus on the top branch and then slowly lets the tree straighten out. Doing this did not actually give Pentheus a better view of the women. He was too high. Instead, it gave the women a great view of him. With Pentheus up in the tree, the voice of Dionysus calls out, saying, Young women, I bring the one who has made you and me and my rights a laughing stock. Now punish him. So the young women entered a frenzy. They threw rocks and three soy staffs at Pentheus and finally begin to tear at the roots of the tree. The tree weakens and Pentheus falls out, and the women, foaming at the mouth and eyes twisting every which way, grab him. Pentheus's mother, Agave, did not even recognize him, and instead participated as the women grabbed each of Pentheus's limbs in turn and ripped them from his body. They threw the pieces all over the place and played catch with them, Pentheus' own mother put his severed head on a staff and paraded around the woods with it. And with that, Dionysus got his revenge on the Thebans who dishonored him. Pentheus, for inhibiting his cult, and Agave, Eno, and Autonoe, for slandering Dionysus' mother, Semele. They were her sisters, and after her death claimed that she had made up the story of being the lover of Zeus, offending Dionysus. This myth provides a good description of the worshippers or female entourage of Dionysus. These women were called Maenids, or Bacchae. They are variously women who joined Dionysus' cult voluntarily, his entourage on Mount Nysa, for example, or those who resisted his worship and joined anyway after he made them go insane. The Maenids are always described as women and in a state of religious ecstasy or frenzy from dancing and drunkenness. They wore the skins of small deer over their bare skin as clothes and carried the thrysis. This special type of staff was sacred to Dionysus, and these sticks were wrapped in ivy or grape leaves and topped with a pine cone. The women ran through the woods and tore apart animals they found, often a sacrificial bull, and then ate the raw flesh. You can understand why this cult was perhaps considered strange by the ancient Greeks. And Thebes was not the only city that made Dionysus feel unwelcome. The Roman poet Ovid shares the story of the Miniades, three princesses of the city Orchomenos in central Greece. Orchomenos was a city in the Boeotia region of central Greece. It's actually very close to Thebes. Between 1300 and 1200 BC, during Mycenaean Greece, Orchomenos was a rich and powerful city. It was a rival of Thebes, but around 1200 BC, it burnt to the ground and never again regained the same level of power and riches. But as a powerful Mycenaean city, it retained some presence in the consciousness of the ancient Greeks, and it actually is the setting of a number of Greek myths. Minyas was the legendary founder of the city, and the Minyades was a term referring to his three daughters. The other women of Orchomenos joined the rites of Dionysus willingly when he arrived, but these three sisters did not, after denying that Dionysus was the son of Zeus. In other sources from Roman times, Dionysus actually appears to the sisters as a girl and invites them to join in. When they refuse, he turns into a bull, then a lion, and then a panther. The sisters are driven mad, and they tear apart one of their sons, just like in the myth with Pentheus. 
All of the versions of this story end the same way, with the sisters going insane and eventually being turned into bats. When Dionysus arrived at the city of Argos, he was treated in a similar way to what happened at Thebes. The king, who is not consistently identified as either a man named Perseus, or Acrisius, or somebody else, stops him from entering the city. The result is muddled in several sources, but Apollodorus says that Dionysus made the women go mad, go into the mountains, and feed on the flesh of their own babies. The Greek Pausanias says a couple things. He says that the king of Argos fought a battle against the worshippers of Dionysus, and was victorious. But Pausanias also says that Dionysus laid aside his anger, and was honored by the people of Argos. So, maybe Argos came to its senses after an extended period of bloodshed. Finally, in Athens, unlike with the other cities, Dionysus was respected from the very beginning by Athens' king, Icarios. In response, Icarios was taught winemaking, a much better trade than being torn apart like Pentheus. So, those are some of the myths of Dionysus' travels in Greece after he decided to bring his cults to specific cities. Sometimes, though, Dionysus did not willingly start his travels. The third Homeric hymn starts with Dionysus standing on the seashore, in the form of a young man and wearing a purple robe, a rare item in the ancient world and something that would have immediately identified him as being fabulously wealthy. Along came some pirates sailing swiftly over the sparkling sea. When they saw him, the pirates looked at each other, made signs, and thought they were lucky to see such easy prey. They spring on Dionysus, brought him on the ship, and thinking he was some prince they could ransom, tried to bind him with ropes. But they could not. Whenever the ropes touched his wrists and feet, they fell away and would not hold him. Dionysus, on his part, simply sat and smiled. The pirates watched, confused. But the helmsman, the man who drives the ship, quickly realized what was happening. He turned to the other pirates and said, Madmen, what god is this whom you have taken and bound, strong that he is? Not even the well-built ship can carry him. Surely this is either Zeus or Apollo of the Silver Bow or Poseidon, for he does not look like mortal men, but looks like the gods who dwell on Olympus. Let us set him free upon the dark shore at once. Do not lay hands on him, or he will grow angry and stir up dangerous winds and heavy squalls. But the pirates did not believe the helmsman. The captain even taunted him and called him insane. The pirates set sail, but soon strange things began to happen. First, the ship was filled with a sweet, fragrant smell and wine began to flow over the deck of the ship. Then, along the top of the sails, vines began to grow and clusters of grapes hung down, while ivy grew up the mast and blossomed with flowers and berries. The pirates saw what was happening to their ship, and they quickly told the helmsman to take them to shore, but it was too late. At that moment, Dionysus transformed into a lion and let out a roar, and at the same time a bear appeared on the deck out of nowhere. The pirates huddled together around the helmsman, watching the beasts, but the line pounced onto the captain of the pirates and ate him. Terrified, all of the pirates dove overboard to escape, but as each of them hit the water, they were transformed into dolphins. The only one who remained was the helmsman. Dionysus took mercy on him, told him not to be afraid, and introduced himself as loud, crying Dionysus. Due to all these myths of Dionysus returning to Greece, scholars in the 19th and 20th century commonly thought that Dionysus was originally a foreign god, and that these stories reflected the different attitudes of Greek communities to the new cults being brought into their homelands. The theory was that Dionysus was then a new god who was incorporated into Greek myths later than the rest. In this way, Dionysus might have been like Aphrodite, Last episode, I mentioned that the name Aphrodite does not appear in the Mycenaean Greek records, making some think that she was a later addition to the Greek pantheon. As it turns out, though, Dionysus is not like Aphrodite. The name Dionysuyo is present in written records from Pylos, a city on the Greek mainland, along with references to wine and women as far back as maybe 1500 BC. This strongly suggests that Dionysus really wasn't all that new, and his recognizable cult and mythology was already well in place in the earlier Mycenaean age. But the myths of Dionysus' return to Greece show something about how the god thinks. He is extremely touchy about people questioning his divinity, 
the gods and goddesses in the Greek myths are notoriously easy to offend, and take revenge on humans all the time. But Dionysus does seem a bit extra. The reason being, though, is he had more to prove. Dionysus was the son of Zeus and the human Semele, immortal and mortal. The other Olympians were either the children of Titans, like Hera, the children of an Olympian and a Titan, like Hermes, or the children of two Olympians, like Ares. Either way, though, they were immortals, and they were the children of two immortals. But Dionysus was different. He was the son of an immortal and a mortal. In the Greek myths, there were lots of people who were the children of immortals and mortals, but they were almost never considered gods. These people were the heroes of Greek mythology. Perseus, Aeneas, Achilles, and many, many more. They went on adventures, and they did great things, but at the end of the day, they were still mortal, and they died like mortals. Dionysus had the same kind of parents as the heroes, but he seems to have had the same kind of powers as a god. But, even being the son of Zeus, he was doubted, mostly because he had been born in secret on Mount Nysa. Eventually, though, Dionysus did become a full immortal and joined the other gods on Mount Olympus. The same thing happened to his mother Semele, too. Hesiod's Theogony, one of our early sources, clearly says that both Dionysus and Semele are now gods. How did this happen? Semele was already dead, after all, accidentally burnt to a crisp by Zeus's lightning. Well, Dionysus went down to the underworld to go get her. Apparently, there was an entrance to the underworld somewhere near Argos. Different versions give different locations. Not much is known of Dionysus' journey to the underworld. A hymn to Semele says that Persephone permitted her to view the light of day and visit mortals. So it seems our Queen of the Dead allowed Dionysus to take his mother back to Olympus to live as a goddess. Pindar, the Greek poet born in 518 BC, at the end of the Archaic period, says that she lives there still, and is loved by Dionysus, Zeus, and strangely also Athena. Once living on Mount Olympus, Dionysus still had to contend with Hera, who disliked him for being yet another one of Zeus's extramarital children, and with a mortal woman no less. However, Dionysus would soon earn Hera's gratitude and her respect, for around the same time, the god Hephaestus made his return to Olympus too. As I went over in the episode on Hephaestus, Hera threw her son off of Mount Olympus for being disabled. He spent the following years in a workshop at the edge of the world, honing his craft and skills at metalworking. Eventually, he sent Hera a magnificent golden chair. When she sat on it, she became stuck and couldn't move. Hephaestus refused to release her, and Hera was only rescued when Dionysus went and met with Hephaestus, got him drunk, and brought him up to Olympus to set her free. For his part in releasing her, Hera found newfound friendship with Dionysus. Besides having a mortal mother who ascended to Mount Olympus, Dionysus also got himself a mortal wife, too. The woman's name was Ariadne, and she was the daughter of King Minos of Crete. Dionysus and Ariadne met on the island of Naxos, after her lover, Theseus, abandoned her there. After sailing there with Theseus, Ariadne fell asleep on the island and woke up to find herself alone. This scene of Dionysus finding her asleep was very popular in classical Greek art, and several accounts speak of their marriage afterwards. Homer's Odyssey, though, gives a different version. In this, Ariadne was not married to Dionysus. Instead, she was killed by Artemis, possibly because she was encouraged to do so by Dionysus, because he was angry after Theseus and Ariadne had sex in his sacred grotto on the island. The more common story, though, is that they were married. Hesiod says that golden-haired Dionysus made brown-haired Ariadne, the daughter of Minos, his wife, and several later sources agree with this. Ariadne accompanied Dionysus on his travels, and many art scenes show her dancing with him and his maenads. The two of them had several human children together. They are Eurymedon, Keramos, Oinopion, Peparathos, Thoas, all nobles and kings, and then Thanos, Phleosos, and Staphylos three heroes. Late period sources say that Ariadne then died in battle when Dionysus and his followers tried to go to Argos, 
But Hesiod says that Zeus made her deathless and unaging for Dionysus, so she probably ended up in Olympus with him and Semele as well. From all these myths, you can tell Dionysus was a very complicated Greek god. He was the god of winemaking, and taught that art to human beings. Tied closely into that were his other rites and worship, his wild maenads and their singing and dancing with their wild religious frenzies. These cults emphasized social exclusions and being outside the larger society, and the special rites usually took place in isolated mountains and the countryside. The cult differed slightly between the different regions of ancient Greece, but it was very much one of several Greek mystery religions. I talked about a few of these in past episodes, especially the episode on Demeter. The Dionysian mysteries were very, very important within the larger religion of ancient Greece. As I already mentioned, the drinking of wine was very important, and possibly also meat, an alcoholic beverage made from honey. During the rites, worshippers went into trances. But we don't know too much about the mysteries, beyond those general descriptions. It did heavily influence other Greek mystery cults, though, especially a major one, referred to as the Orphic Mysteries. We actually know a little bit more about the Orphic Mysteries, and what myths and teachings were important to it. I would describe the Orphic Mysteries as an offshoot of the general ancient Greek religion. It was very widespread throughout the society as time went by. The Orphic Mysteries are very strange. Sometimes it gives very different versions of the Greek myths I've already talked about. For example, the Orphic Mysteries give a completely different account of the creation of the world, which I don't have time to talk about in this episode. But the Orphic Mysteries also give a very different side of Dionysus. In the Mysteries, Semele is not the original mother of Dionysus. She is instead Dionysus' second mother. Originally, Dionysus was the son of Zeus and Persephone, the queen of the underworld, of all people. This Orphic Mystery Dionysus is typically named Zagreus instead. Zagreus was murdered on the orders of Hera by the Titans, but he is later reborn as Dionysus when Zeus impregnates the second mother, Semele. But this isn't even the only version. The Orphics also had other versions, with variations too. At some point, I'll have to go into more detail with the Orphic mysteries. But for now, know that they represented a significant change in the mythic traditions surrounding Dionysus. And that's all for today. If you're enjoying this podcast, please provide a 5-star review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps grow the pod. Next week, I'll pick up with some more Greek goddesses. As always, thank you for listening.